All right. Well, we're going to look today, this morning, at uh, chapter 16 of Ezekiel. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and we're going to be thinking about the unfaithful wife. Uh, we so far have seen in chapter 13 untruthful prophets. We've seen unseen idolatry in chapter 14, a useless vine in chapter 15, and an unfaithful wife here in chapter 16. And as we read it and then meditate on it, I want to suggest to you that um, this chapter is absolutely relevant to 21st century um, believers uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, very relevant to all of us. So may the Lord help us as we consider it together. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee, thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil Clothed thee, I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. And thou was, uh, thus was thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. And God indeed will <clears throat> bless the reading of that precious portion of scripture to us uh, this morning. We mentioned that this is the longest chapter in Ezekiel, and most likely it'll take us more than one session to cover it. Uh, it's also a very uh, challenging passage because uh, the target audience is Jerusalem. We mentioned previously, he says in verse 2, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And of course, the reason Jerusalem is mentioned is that it was the center of idolatry. We saw that when we looked at chapter 8, uh, when Ezekiel was taken, as it were, by the lock of the hair of his head and transported to Jerusalem, and he saw what was going on in the very temple of God. Uh, the very place where God had chosen to place his name there had become the center of idolatry for the nation. And so he says, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And of course, this is uh, God's purpose here to show, uh, first of all, all that he had done for them, uh, and then how they have responded to his kindness. And this is where the challenge comes in. It's kind of a history lesson of what they once were and what God had done to them and for them and how they had responded to God's mercy and kindness. 
And so uh, we did make an observation. I just want to repeat it that in verses 1 through 14, as we go through this section, we want to pay attention to the personal pronoun. And it's always speaking of what God had done for them. And so, for instance, we'll see in verse 6, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live ye, I said unto thee. And we could, uh, and again, I'd encourage you to go through and, and just kind of put a ring around if, you, if you're a Bible marker. All the times it talks about what I did for them, what the Lord did for them. And then the tragedy is that the second half of the book, uh, really, or the chapter from verse 15, down to verse 41, we read uh, again and again these terms, harlot and whoredom and whore. And the idea is this, that she, in her beauty that God had gloriously given to her, then prostituted herself to other nations. And so it's a, it's a tragic, tragic chapter. So we just uh, want to kind of keep that in our mind uh, before we move forward. And of course, we said that part of the reason... And again, I just want to emphasize this because it's so important, was that she had forgotten what the Lord had done for her. She had forgotten where she once was and all the Lord had done for us, for her. And we see that verse 22, in all thine abominations, thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the day of thy youth. Again, we see it mentioned in verse 43, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. And so we said, you know, from a practical standpoint for you and I, uh, this chapter is very challenging because it, it's easy to forget where we once were before the Lord met us, what we once were before the Lord gloriously saved us, that if there's anything good in our lives, uh, anything beautiful, it's because of what the Lord has done for us. And it's very easy to become self-righteous and become lifted up with pride and think that we're something. And we, we look down on others and we think, well, I'm not like them and all the rest of it. And we forget what we once were and we, for, we forget what the Lord has done for us. That's why the gospel is so important to hear gospel preaching, to remind us what we once were. That's why the Lord's Supper is so important. Lest I forget Gethsemane, uh, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, uh, lead me to Calvary. So uh, these people, they, they basically had forgotten all that God had done for them, became lifted up with pride and then turned to harlotry. So again, we'll, we'll dive into the text now. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, again, the, remember the elders are still there in front of him waiting to hear messages from God. And uh, he's answering their folly, their foolish thinking. They're thinking, well, because uh, we're married to Jehovah, he'll never cast us off, you know, because Jerusalem is so central to his purposes. Uh, we we may be attacked, but we'll never be defeated. And so they had a false sense of security. He's basically seeking to undermine their false ideas. And so the word of the Lord comes to him saying, son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. And so the depths of her abominations is going to be contrasted in this chapter with the heights of which divine grace had taken her. So we're going to have set beside the heights of the divine grace contrasted with the depths of the abominations that they did as a nation. And what a contrast it really is. And what a challenge it really is. So verses 3 through 6, we have her state before God blessed her. Okay, this is this is what she was before God stepped in on her behalf. And then from verse 7 through 14, her state after God blessed her and how uh, he he caused her to prosper and become beautiful and all the rest of it. And in, in one sense, that's that's how to give a testimony, isn't it? And we, we, we appreciate hearing testimonies. I, I love to hear testimony meetings. But a good testimony begins with our state, we might say, B.C., before Christ, <laughs> what we were like before Christ intervened in our lives. And then uh, we want to end on what our life is like now since we met Christ, what he's done for us, uh, how he's transformed us and changed us and the, the beauty of the gospel and what it's done for us. And of course, in between the before Christ and, and after Christ, uh, we need to emphasize 
the work of the cross and how we came to see ourselves as sinners and saw him as the only hope uh, for us. And so that's basically the picture here. Verses 3 through 6 state before God blessed her, 7 through 14 state after God blessed her. So he says in verse 3, and say, Thus saith the Lord God to Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother a Hittite. Now, again, this would be absolutely shocking for these people to hear this. Uh, because in one sense, uh, of course, the Amorites, the Hittites are general names for the people of Canaan who occupied the land prior to Abraham and uh, before uh, the, the the Jews were supposed to drive them out. This was the original occupants of the land. And yet we know there's no direct connection between the ancestry of Israel or Judah and the Amorites and the Hittites. So, uh, of course, we know Abraham came from Ur the Chaldees. So, so there's no physical connection. Despite this, the Lord uses these other nations as symbolic representatives of Israel's character. The name Amorite, Hittite, to be understood to be a taunt, uh, as though they were not descendant from Abraham at all, uh, the same way the Lord Jesus in John 8, 44 said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. Now, Ezekiel, as he's moved by the Spirit of God, is saying to these people, your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite, uh, basically saying that this is really their moral character. It's a moral rather than a historical notation. Jerusalem was the Amorite and the Hittite personified. She had the moral characteristics in character and outlook. She was thoroughly Canaanitish. <laughs> she had become like the Canaanites. And again, what we're going to see here in the book of Ezekiel is this. God is entirely consistent. When it came to the Canaanites, their sin was so wicked that God says the land itself vomits them out. And the reason that the Canaanites had to be destroyed was because of their wickedness. Now, God's own chosen people had actually managed to out -sin the Canaanites. So what is God going to do? He's going to be consistent to his character. And the land itself is going to vomit them out because they have been as bad and worse than the Hittites and the Amorites. And so basically, God is saying that you're not staying in Jerusalem. I'm going to spew you out. And uh, that's exactly what he is planning to do to them. So the statement is heavy with sarcasm uh, because the, Can the term Canaanite is a byword for immorality. And that's exactly what had happened to Jerusalem. They had not um, been, certainly not been chosen by God because of their goodness, but rather in spite of their sinfulness. Such characterization would not accord with Israel's self-esteem and self-regard. They thought they were something special. And he reminds them what they really were by nature and by choice. And so verse 4 he says, and as for thy nativity in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee, thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. So the picture is a neglected child, nothing done for it. Uh, its navel is uncut. So the umbilical cord, although uh, disconnected from its mother, was still connected to the child, if you like. So there's the picture, uncut, unwashed, um, uh, not salted. Uh, of course, the, the idea of salting believed to have antiseptic qualities and not swaddled, wrapped in clothes to keep her limbs straight for her protection. And so he says, you are not robbed with salt. In salting the child, the skin is rubbed with salt to make it firm and clean. Uh, again, with this antiseptic aspect, cutting the cord, washing, rubbing down with salt, clothing the newborn were also customary legal acts of legitimization. Uh, that's how you kind of legitimize the birth of a child. You, you took those things and did those things for the child. In the neglect and abandonment of the infant in the open field, the parent legally relinquished all rights to and responsibilities for the child. In fact, this was an, a custom 
amongst heathen and barbarous nations who had a child that either they felt they couldn't afford or uh, has some kind of disability or some kind of deformity. And what they would often do is they would just throw the child in the bush and leave it to die. In fact, uh, when we were in New Tribe's mission, we, we was interesting the number of these incidents where uh, the missionaries actually rescued children that had just been thrown into the bush to die because they were considered to be either an economic hardship or considered to be deformed in some way. In our Western civilization, we just abort them. That's what we do. So we're no different. We're no different to a pagan society. Uh, in fact, it's a terrible thing and a terrible reproach on Western civilization that we have adopted heathendom's principles uh, as a standard in our culture. And actually, even this election, uh, one of the things in the U.S. election that's going to be about is abortion rights. And it's tragic. Uh, right here in Missouri, proposition number three, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they've got it on the ballot. They don't they, they want uh, to make abortion legal right up to birth. Tragic, tragic thing. So thrown out into the open field, this idea of being abandoned. And so the idea is that that this little nation of Israel and Judah, they really weren't wanted, uh, lost and vulnerable. They were without God, cast out into the open field, left in a wilderness where it's not likely that any should pass by, thrown where the cold can smite by night, the heat can blast by day and left where wild beast goes about seeking whom he may devour. Such is the helpless estate of this nation. And by the way, our helpless estate before the Lord found us. Uh, we were vulnerable. We were all at sea. And so, of course, it refers to the time of the early patriarchs when they were in Canaan and Egypt. The nation was weak and liable to perish. In fact, it says in verse 5, None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. No one took pity, no tender care, an unwanted, uncared for infant. And it, if you think about it, you look at Israel's early history, first of all, as shepherds, Jacob and his family were considered an abomination to the Egyptians. When they went into the land, the Canaanites, they were unwelcome invaders. Nobody wanted them. Nobody loved them but God. Isn't that wonderful to think about it too, though? For many of us, that's our experience. Unwanted except by the Lord. And I have a friend, he was uh, uh, adopted and uh, uh, as a child. And again, just uh, it didn't work out well. He ended up going from foster home to foster home. And every time he, he speaks uh, before God's people, he, he breaks down and he says, you people are the only family I've ever known. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, wonderful, by the way, to be part of the family of God. Verse six, he says, and when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live, yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Continuing the illustration from the previous verses, God took note of Israel in their humble, hated state. They would have perished struggling in your own blood if not for God's grace-filled intervention in their lives. And we know that we would have eternally perished if it wasn't for God's gracious intervention in our lives. When all their circumstances, all other nations said, die to Israel, God said, live. He brought life to them and made them thrive like a plant in the field. He pronounces the sentence of life upon the child, otherwise sentenced to certain death. His passion is reflected in the emphatic twofold declaration in your blood, live. And of course, he's, he's the one who's the giver of life. He wants us to have life. The unwarranted grace of God in taking up such an unattractive child is emphasized so there can be no thought of merit or natural attractiveness on the part of the nation to draw attention of Jehovah. He passed by, he saw them in their pitiable state, and he said, in your blood, live. Because it mentions twice uh, that he passed by, verse 6, when I passed by thee and saw thee, 
And then verse 8, now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee. And so it's good. To, there's a great series of sermons I have in my library by Gypsy Smith. And it simply says this, as Jesus passed by. <laughs> and it talks about all the lives that were affected as Jesus passed by. And we think about this here. As yeah, God, when I passed by thee, now when I passed by thee, saw the pitiable condition and had mercy on them. So it's good for us to be reminded ourselves that where we are today is all because of the mercy and grace of God. Left to ourselves, where would we be? What would be our state? It wouldn't be a pretty state, but the Lord has very graciously stepped in uh, to all of our lives, passed by, saw us in our pitiable state and had compassion upon us. And so, Verse 7, it says, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great. Thou art come to an excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned. Thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. So notice he says, I have caused thee to multiply. So the foundling little nation has become a beautiful young woman. Yet it's stated that she was naked and bare. The implication may be that she was without wealth and without the benefits of culture and civilization as the world sees them. We move kind of from allegory to history now. When God affirms the great growth of the nation of Israel, I cause thee to bud, as it were, and to blossom. And so the Lord is um, incre increasing them as a nation, and we see this, uh, just look at, for instance, at, at their increase. Go back to Exodus 12, and verse 37 and 38. It says, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds upon every much cattle. And so 600,000 from their humble beginnings, souls to 6,000 men. Uh, and of course, uh, with uh, the average of two children uh, plus women, uh, many believe that the nation of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, uh, was at least 1.8 million, some say maybe two to three million people left Egypt. Just want you to look uh, with me in Acts 7 just for a moment, just to see have them coming to their, as it were, maturity. Acts 7, verse 14. Stephen's sermon reminds us of their small beginnings. And it says, Then then sent he Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. <laughs> and so 75 souls has now become a great nation of two to three million people. Such has been their prospering under God's hand. And so then he says, um, and very interesting uh, scripture in verse 8, he says, Now when I had passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, the time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. And of course, I'm sure it reminds us of the book of Ruth, uh, the spreading the skirt. Remember how, uh, we, well, let me just read it, uh, Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9. When uh, Ruth is taken uh, under the care, uh, Ruth 3 verse 9, it says, And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman unto me. And so it's really a picture uh, of engagement or betrothal. She's asking him to, to play the part of the kinsman redeemer. And because we know the rest of the story, he's got to check because somebody else uh, may have a priority in that. But ultimately, she's saying, enter into uh, an engagement or betrothal. And so this is when God entered into this kind of marriage relationship. He began with the betrothal. He spread his skirt on thee. And then it said, I entered into a covenant with you. Of course, it's a marriage covenant. 
in context, still naked and bare, uh, naming without wealth and benefits of culture and civilization, yet the Lord entered into this covenant with this nation. Verse 9, he says, Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. And of course, the, the, these verses from 9 through 14 talks about all the Lord has done for her. He cleansed her, clothed her with beautiful garments, expensive garments, clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin and guarded thee about, girded thee about with fine linen. I covered thee with silk. And so just, just think about some of the things that he's doing here for her, cleansing her, clothing her with these beautiful, expensive garments, washing, anointing with ceremonies preparatory to marriage. And so anointing her with oil, uh, bridal jewels, were lavished upon her. I decked thee with ornaments, put bracelets on thy hands and chains on thy neck and a jewel on thy forehead, earrings in thine ears, beautiful crown upon thy head. And so uh, also uh, his the diet he provides for her. Notice again in verse 13, that thou, was, thou decked with gold and silver, thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil. Thou was exceeding beautiful thou didst prosper into a kingdom. So the Lord takes her and beautifies her and makes her prosperous, lavishing upon her jewels, fine flour, food, oil. Uh, all these are the food of the rich. And um, again, Jerusalem prospered from this, uh, this nation, basically, of refugees that had been in Egypt, came out, and then they prospered and became a beautiful and did prosper into a kingdom. We think about Jerusalem under David and climaxing under the reign of Solomon and the amazing changes that God brought about. Their renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. Of course, we'll look at this in more detail as we go through these verses one at a time. But basically, what we find is that they went from this this terrible distressed state to a place of great exaltation, so much so that their renown went forth among the heathen. So you have people like the Queen of Sheba making this lengthy journey because she's heard about all that God had done for Jerusalem and for this nation. And so uh, all, all of this, you know, in fact, when she comes, what what's her response? She says, the half has not been told me. Such was God's loving kindness and care to this people. All of this was from the good and gracious hand of God. How far the abandoned child had come. It's a marvelous illustration of what the grace of God can do for a sinner. Taking us out, as it were, of the depths of, and making us into something beautiful. <laughs> it's amazing what the Lord, and of course the coming day, uh, when when we're uh, transformed into his likeness, oh, it's going to be amazing. People say, wow, look at what happened to that guy. <laughs> uh, how amazing it is what God has done for us. But let's just kind of look at them in a bit more detail, because it's interesting that some of the language that's used here, for instance, the shoes are made of badger skin. Uh, that's the same material used in the covering of the tabernacle. He's using that to cover her feet. Um, the garments that have been provided by Jehovah serve to de demonstrate the glory of his wife. The broidered work uh, that is mentioned uh, is in Psalm 45, verse 14, is used to describe Solomon's bride's garment. <laughs> and so it's the very same language, uh, the raiment of needlework. And so, again, just the, the, the beauty which God lavishes upon them. Uh, so she's been transformed from an unwanted infant left out to die in unspeakable circumstance into a woman of beauty, dignity, and glory. Furthermore, her special food, fine flour and oil, figured prominently in the sacred offerings. In short, Jerusalem, the bride of Jehovah, is clothed with the garments that clothe the sanctuary and is fed with the food of its offerings. Such is God's elevation of this baby. And of course, we said that uh, 
in verse 14 talks about this kingdom that is filled with renown. And of course, during the reign of King David, during Solomon's early years, Jerusalem was indeed a queenly city in Israel, a prosperous kingdom. As long as Israel, Jehovah's wife, obeyed his word and kept his covenant, he blessed her abundantly. Just as he promised, he gave her healthy children, fruitful flocks and herds, abundant harvest, protection from disease, disaster and invasion. And so the events uh, that are mentioned here, compressed into a short but vivid picture, bring us up to the time of the magnificence of Solomon's reign. And this is what God did in elevating them. And we just think again of uh, 1 Kings 10 and the Queen of Sheba coming. Uh, we see how uh, the wonder and the glory of it that the Lord did. And yet, having got to this peak of verse 14, let me read the tragic verse, verse 15. But, see, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? That up to now, all beautiful, what God has done. And then we come to this word, but. <laughs> Whenever you see the word, but, it's a contrast word. It's it's uh, Everything's going to change. Sometimes it changes from negative to positive. Uh, often in the New Testament, it talks about being far off. You know, uh, it says, but uh, we who once were far off are now brought near. Uh, so often it's used in a positive way, but here the contrast is very negative. He says, uh, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and poured out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. So how tragic. Uh, Ezekiel is going to later level this same charge of being corrupted because of your beauty and the pride of it all to the king of Tyre, who actually, as we will see when we get there, is none other than Satan himself. And notice uh, Ezekiel 28, 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I'll cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that thou they may behold thee. And so the great sin of Satan is the sin of pride. And this nation became proud of her beauty, as if she had done something about it, as if it was something to do with her. And it was all of what God had done for her. And so this is the, the, the charge God is saying. Uh, your heart was lifted up on account of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom on account of your splendor. From a new covenant perspective, it's staggering to think and to believe that we have even more in Jesus Christ than Israel had when they were blessed under the old covenant. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in every heavenly places in Christ. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. We have so, so many, many blessings from the Lord. It's, un, it's unreal. Uh, he has washed us. He has anointed us. He's clothed us uh, with garments of salvation, clothed us with righteousness. He's provided for us. He's adorning us, crowning us, etc. Uh, it, 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 so much more we have under the new covenant. And again, we find that in this case, he took the initiative. I anointed thee, I clothed thee, I decked thee. And we're reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, where Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Isn't that good to be reminded this morning, dear brothers, that by the grace of God, we are what we are. If it wasn't for the grace of God, well, for one thing, I'd say you wouldn't want to be listening to me. Uh, and secondly, you probably wouldn't want to listen anyway, whoever was speaking, if it wasn't for the grace of God intervening in your life. And, and so isn't it wonderful what the Lord has done for us? And yet, let us learn from Israel's experience. And so from verse 15 down to verse 34, 
the study of the unfaithful wife, um, I, I want to suggest to you that we could write over this. And this is why I've been saying for a long time that I, I just see that in Romans chapter 1, it's not so much the heathen nation that's in view. It's Israel that's in view. They had the glory of God. Uh, to him, to them were given the glory. And it says um, uh, that um, they, they rejected that and, and they worshipped idols instead. And, and a verse that is in, in my mind particularly is, is the thought of neither were they thankful. And we see that here for all that God had done for them. Uh, they, the, this tragic nation uh, were not thankful for what the Lord had done for them. And again, what, what an indictment. And again, I just think for ourselves, um, one of the things that studying this passage has done for me is it has really made me think afresh. Where would I be today if it wasn't for the grace of God? And I don't ever want to forget it and uh, and I, I want to constantly remember what the Lord has done. And if there's anything good in any of our lives, it's only anything beautiful. It's only because of what he has done. And so we, we can allow ourselves to, to, to end up where Israel were. Neither were they thankful. And we certainly can see that here in this particular chapter. So from verse 15, you did tr trust in thine own beauty, played the harlot. Again, this is going to be mentioned over and over again, her harlotry, uh, her whoredoms. Uh, she, she went after other lovers. And so what a contrast, all that God had done. And now what did Israel do? What did Jerusalem do? And of course, this pride was the result of, uh, or the root of, of Israel's decline. They forgot that they were nothing when God found them, that he had bestowed their beauty upon them. He had brought to, they'd been brought to beauty by God's blessing. They trusted in the blessings God gave instead of God himself. So this is from verse 15 through 35 is one of the strongest denunciations of Israel's sin found in the entire Bible. And, of course, there are many rebukes of Israel's sin by the prophets of Israel. And many of them are well known, but none is so vivid, so vehement, so sordid, so piercing as these words. Prosperity can be a dangerous thing. In the midst of it, it's easy to forget the Lord. And money can be used for self-indulgence and idolatry in its various forms. God had warned Israel not to forget him when she came into all the benefits that he would give her in the promised land. Just look back at Deuteronomy where we get this reminder uh, so clearly. A couple of portions in Deuteronomy that where God warned them about this. Deuteronomy 6 verse 10. He says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Beware, lest thou forget the Lord. And then Deuteronomy 17. Because really, a lot of these problems begin with Solomon. They, of course, we know that judges gave an early uh, picture of what these people were capable of in the book of Judges. But things seem to get sorted out after Samuel. And then they reach this pinnacle under Solomon. And yet there's a graphic warning here in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, verse 14. And we'll read down to verse 20. It says, when thou art come into the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. This is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17, 14. It says, and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say, I will uh, set a king over me like all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. And from among thy brethren shalt thou set a king over thee, 
Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth return no way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and the children in the midst of Israel. And tragically, Despite these warnings, clear warnings, Solomon, well, we know what happened, 1 Kings 11. Right after chapter 10, 1 Kings 10, when the Queen of Sheba comes and marvels what happens in 1 Kings 11, the very thing God warned him about, don't multiply wives in case they take you away from the Lord, it says in verse chapter 11, verse 1, but, and again, isn't it amazing, the parallel? After all that God had done, the Queen of Sheba, the renown that they had, she's come from afar to see it. But, it says, King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, so on and so forth. And it says, verse 3, he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, and his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect before the Lord his God, and so on and so forth. And so the very thing that God had warned them against, don't forget him when you come into your prosperity. Don't forget him when you get a king, uh, but they forgot the Lord. The, the high places were established during Solomon's reign and continued to be a snare right up to the days of Ezekiel. She took the things of God her husband had provided for her and used a newfound wealth to support her lovers and her idols. Another passage that we should bear in mind as well, which I think is also a great warning passage, is that when when we we when the Lord puts us in this position uh, where we're so blessed of him that we soon forget him and we become lifted up with pride, is the story of King Uzziah. And I just want to read one scripture from Second Chronicles where we see again the very same tendency to be uh, in our prosperity to forget the Lord and think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It says, verse 16 of Second Chronicles 26, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And so, again, here's another example. When he was strong, when when he's elevated, when he's in this great position. And, um, and so this is exactly what happened. Thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and poured out thy fornications on everyone that passed by his it was. So <clears throat> to deserve such a strong rebuke, Israel began by forgetting an important principle. Every good they were, everything good they were, and all the good they had were the gift of God's grace to them. Many centuries later, the Apostle Paul wrote of the same principle for Christians. So this is 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. What a challenging verse it is. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? 
Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And again, again, we see in the word of God, don't we, this, this warning, this very important warning to all of us that we should never forget that everything we have is from the Lord. If we have gift, where did it come from? It came from the Lord. Uh, if we have ability to work and and uh, make uh, money and resources, who gave us the brains? Uh, who gives us the breath we breathe? It's it's all from the Lord, and we cannot forget Him. We cannot forget Him in the midst of our prosperity. It's a very very dangerous dangerous business. And so the behavior of Israel is so abominable that she is seen as living in an excess of wantonness, offering herself to every passerby. You, you talk about immorality. This The idea is this, that she is so immoral that anybody who comes by, she's fair game. And that's what he says here isn't it, in verse 15. And pourest out thy fornications on everyone that pass by. Not even any discrimination. Uh, she is the ultimate loose woman in every way. And so I notice it says in verse 16, And of thy garments thou didst take and deckest thy high places with diverse colors and played the harlot thereupon. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. So thy garments thou didst take. Where did she get the garments from, by the way? Who was it that clothed her with those garments? The Lord did. And what is she using them for? She's using them to make her high places. She's taken the beautiful garments that God had provided for her, her husband, as it were, and she's using them to, to decorate the high places that she's making for the various idols. Verse 17, it says, Thou also hast taken thy fair jewels of my gold. And, of, and notice notice the, the phrase here, of my gold, because Again, her husband had provided it. And of my silver, which I had given thee, again, all comes from him, and made us to thyself images of men and didst commit whoredom with them. So the jewels made into images, also the gold and silver used in this wicked way. So in other words, she devoted her resources, God-given resources, to idolatry. And it's good to ask ourselves, what are we doing with the resources that God has given to us? Is it all for his glory or is it for selfish interest or selfish gain? Uh, verse 18, and took us thy broided garments and coverest them and thou didst set mine oil and mine incense before them. So again, her broided garments, her oil, her incense, all devoted to idols. Everything God had provided for her, she's now taking these resources and using them in idol worship. Verse 19, my meat also, again, notice the my again, which also I gave thee, fine flour, oil, honey, wherewith I fed thee, thou hast even set it before them, these idols, these high places, for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God. The very things that they should have used in the worship of God were used in the worship of idols, things that he had given them, that he had provided them. And perhaps even more shocking is what we see in verse 20. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, and thou hast born unto me, and thou hast, these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms, is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? that thou hast slain my children, notice that, my children, and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. So she actually devoted her children to idolatry. And of course, this is express, expressly forbidden uh, in the Old Testament, uh, book of Leviticus. Just notice this, Leviticus 18, verse 21. He says this, thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 20, verses 2 through 5, again it says, again thou shalt say to the children of Israel, 
whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary, to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyway hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I'll set my face against that man and against his family will cut him off and all to go whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among the people. And we know the story. It's a, it's actually a kind of a tragic place to, to end today. But um, uh, they uh, we know the story that this uh, Molech was um, basically uh, an idol uh, that um, a pagan god, or more likely, realistically, a demon. Uh, but Molech was worshipped by heating a metal statue representing the God until it was red hot and then placing a living infant on the outstretched hands of the statue while beating drums to drown out the screams of the child until it burned to death. And we know of at least two of Judah's kings, descendants of Solomon, King Ahaz and King Manasseh, that offered their children to Moloch. Terrible, isn't it? People who had been so blessed by God, and they turn around and they do this. And again, what's the warning to you and I? Because our time has gone this morning, but our warning is very simple. King of my life, I crown thee now. <laughs> Thine the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Brethren, don't forget. Never forget the pit from which you have been digged. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He's put a new song on my lips, even praise to our God. May that be true of all of us. Brethren, don't forget what the Lord has done for you. Amen.